information. If you want the notes, you can go to gracelifebiblechurch.com and scroll down and click on today's date, which is April 3rd, less than 174. You can load the notes that I'm going to be using to teach this particular lesson. Um, we got Amy in house is going to be uh, noting any changes or corrections that need to be made, and then uh, we'll make those before we um, finalize this stuff here for um, the website. So we got uh, some new folks with us today. We want to welcome you guys to class. You are coming into a class at lesson 173. So that means there are a hundred and actually 174. There are 173 lessons in this series before this point. We've been talking about the inspiration, preservation, transmission, and translation of the Word of God, and we've gone all the way through, and we are now at a point where we're looking at the King James Bible itself and how it came into existence. And we're looking at um, some of the primary source documents. There are three primary source documents that have survived. This is image I have on the screen right here. This is of a document in the Bodleian Library known as Bod 1602. This is a 1602 Bishop's Bible with the handwritten notations of the translators interlinear and in the margin. And this is their work in progress document and we've been talking about Bod 1602, the Old Testament portion of it now, for this will be the third Sunday that we're doing that, right? So let's get right into the notes and look at the uh, introduction point here. In a minute, I'm going to be putting a PowerPoint up here and uh, saying a few things about that when we get to that point. So, introduction. In Lesson 173, we continued our look at Bod 1602 and its impact on the readings found in the King James Old Testament. So again, we're only talking right now about the Old Testament portion. We have not yet discussed the New, all right? We did so by tracking the examples provided by Dr. Edward Jacobs in his 1975 essay the paper, uh, for the Papers of the Bibliographic Society of America titled An Old Testament Copy Text for the 1611 Bible. In Lesson 172, we looked at Category 1 examples. In doing so, we looked at the second class or category of examples where the annotations found in Bot 1602 were not an identical match to the final product of 1611. Put another way, the AV exhibits further revisions beyond those noted in Bod 1602. Some 5 to 10 percent of the readings found in Bod 1602, according to Dr. Jacobs, fit this category. So my stuff got erased, but um, we two weeks ago in Lesson 171, we looked at Category 1, which are examples where the annotations made in Bod 1602 match exactly with what ended up in a 1611 King James Bible, all right? Then last Sunday in Lesson 173, we looked at Category 2. Category 2 being where the annotations noted in Bot 1602 are not identically matched to a 1611 King James Bible because further revision were done after the production of Bot 1602 by the final committee, by the Committee of Final Review at Stationers Hall, which was the last step in the production of the King James before it went to the press. Okay? So try to be clear about all of these things. Next point, after discussing this category, this class or category of emendations, Dr. Jacobs offers the following summary statements, quote, the first observation evident from a study of these collated verses in class two is that the amended and the AV readings do not agree with each other. Neither do the first two of the amended readings agree with an earlier reading of this verse. The amended readings do not represent a collation effort between the Bishop's Bible and the AV or between the Bishop's Bible and an earlier English Bible. This class of emendations is discussed in more detail in Dr. Jacob's unpublished doctoral dissertation, quote, the second class of amended readings found within the annotated portions of the Old Testament of this Bishop's Bible, 1602, consists of those annotated and unannotated un un verses that are not completely accepted by the AV text of 1611. There is some variation between these amended readings and the corresponding AV readings which suggests that later translation work was performed after the work uh, evident in the annotated portions of the Old Testament text. Because these variations, however, amount to probably no more than 5 to 10 percent of the, all the amended verses, it is quite possible to account for these differences as the work of the Committee of Final Review in London, who, upon receiving the work, 
here recorded in the Old Testament, checked it carefully and found it wanting in some 5 to 10% of its revisions. Upon the nature and validity of the reading in, readings in this class rests the thesis that these annotations reveal the King James translators at work in a late stage in their translational efforts. Okay, So that's what we saw last time. So there's two different categories or classes. Class 1 is where the annotations and amendments made to the bishop's text match exactly with what ended up in the King James. And then there's a second class or category where there are further changes after this document, and the only place those could have been made is at the Committee of Final Review, that last step where 12 men reviewed the text one last time before they turned it over to the printer to print the text. Okay, So in summation, there is a direct and strong linkage between Bot 1602 and, a, and the King James Bible. 90% of the annotated and unannotated verses found in Bod 1602 cohere exactly with a 1611 King James Bible. A remaining 5 to 10% of the readings amended in Bod 1602 exhibit further revision in the AV. In these cases, the emendations exhibit the choices of the general meeting during the final stage of the work. Top page 2. In this lesson, we want to consider the additional work done on the topic by Dr. Jacobs in his 1980 piece for the library titled Two Stages of Old Testament Translation for the King James Bible, in which he expanded his arguments from his 1975 publication. Okay, now, before we get into the next point, does anybody have any questions about the introduction or review? Makes perfect sense, right? All right, good, good, good. Moving on. <laughs> then, if no one has any questions, we'll go to the first point, which is on page two, which is really our main point, and that is to look at two stages of Old Testament translation for the King James Bible. And this is Dr. Jacobs' 1980 essay. So let's look at the first point here. In 1980, Dr. Jacobs published a second essay for the uh, library titled two stages of Old Testament translation for the King James Bible, in which he expanded on his arguments from his 1975 publication. Regarding his earlier work, Jacob stated, quote, this Bible, referring to this one, Bot 1602, has copious handwritten annotations throughout much of the Old and New Testaments. Scholars have long considered these annotations of little value, but Professor Allen thought otherwise, under his direction, I studied the Old Testament while he studied the New Testament. My published conclusions argue that the Old Testament annotations represent a valid record of a large portion of the work of the Old Testament translators as it existed in its final stage before it went to the general meeting for final review. I base such conclusions on three sorts of evidence. The bibliographic state of the Bible, the annotator's hand and method, and the text and textual collation of the annotations with the King James Bible and earlier English translations. The purpose of Dr. Jacob's 1980 essay is stated as follows, quote, Since establishing these conclusions, I have sought to determine whether the Old Testament annotations can establish quantitatively and qualitatively the amounts and types of revisionary work that the Old Testament companies and the general meeting performed. Okay, so let's be clear. What does quantitative mean? Amount, Amount or number. What does qualitative mean? The nature or quality of what's being revised. Okay, so he's going to look at two different things. How many changes, that would be quantitative, and what kind of changes they were, that would be qualitative. Is everybody following that? Okay. The first half of Dr. Jacob's essay is, devoting to, is devoted to sharing his findings regarding the number of revisions performed by the translational companies and the general meeting. This takes the form of presenting a somewhat complicated table accompanied by explanatory text. The following is a copy of Jacob's table. I will leave the PowerPoint on the screen throughout the lesson and annotate it as we proceed. So if you go to the top of page 3, in your notes, you will see this table. This is the table that is uh, provided by Jacobs. Notice it's got quantitative and qualitative distribution of changes. It looks very confusing. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this in a PowerPoint and I'm going to project it onto the um, TV so that as we go through this information, you guys can track with what's going on here. And I'm also going to turn on my editing features so that we can look at and make notes on this as we go through here. So let me just make sure this is working. All right, good. And I might need to go a little finer to the pen. All right. So page three, Jacobs explains table one quantitative distribution as follows. So I'll have this up here so we can reference it and we'll go through what he says about it here in the notes. Okay. Table one consists of five groups, Roman numerals one through five. Okay. So where did it, okay. So one, two, three, four, five. Group one, group two, group three, group four, group five across the top, right? So here's one, two, three, four, and five. Everybody with me? Okay. These vertical columns are divided into four horizontal divisions labeled at the extreme left. So first Oxford Company, first Westminster Company, first Cambridge Company, and totals, okay? So that's over here. So you got the first Oxford Company here, first Westminster Company here, first Cambridge Company here, and then the totals here, all right? So we've got five groups across the top and then a few different identifications, right? So the first Oxford Company is obviously gonna be the group that is working on Nahum through Habakkuk. The first Westminster Company is Ruth in the case study, and the first Cambridge is Song of Solomon. So he's, he's identified sample work from each company, okay? Samples are of approximate, not exact length for each sample, represents a complete book or books for each, uh, that each company revised. First Oxford, Nahum, and Habakkuk, okay? So that's right here. Nahum and Habakkuk, we're talking about for the first Oxford. First Westminster, we're talking about the book of Ruth. And then for... Um, First Cambridge, we're talking about Song of Solomon, right? So understand if we look at these things here, we're not talking about the whole work, we're talking about a sample size, right? Now the reason for that is this would, this would be inordinate, inordinately huge if this were done for the entire Old Testament, right? So what Jacobs did is he selected a sample from each company of approximately the same length as far as number of words and amount of information to, co to, to conduct what he's doing here, okay? Group one in the table takes sample passages from three of the Old Testament companies and quantifies the number of revisions made in, made, excuse me, made to the 1602 Bishop's Bible as found in Bob 1602. So that's this right here. Total verses, uh, we'll get into what all of this means here as we work our way through this, okay? So group one presents statistics dealing with the work of each of the translator companies. It consists of the first five, of first five vertical columns following the name of each company. The first vertical column labeled total verses identifies the total number of verses in each sample of the translator companies. Okay, so notice. So for the first one on Habakkuk, how many verses are in the sample? 103. For the second one in Ruth, how many verses are in the sample? 85. And for the, the first Oxford or first Cambridge, how many verses are in the sample? 112. So they're approximately the same. They're not exactly the same, but they're approximately the same. All right. Column two labeled A with a zero in parentheses below identifies the number of verses and percentage in each sample that the translator companies approved in the 1602 Bishop's Bible without making any revisions whatsoever, okay? So this column here shows you how many verses they just accept without any what? Revision, okay? So of the 103, they accept six verses without revision for 5.8%. So that means that six verses in Nahum to Habakkuk did the King James translators accept six verses into the AV with zero change? You guys follow this? Okay? 
So that's 5.8% of that section. Let's go back to the notes. Um, column 3, labeled B, with numbers 1 through 3 in parentheses below, identifies the number of verses and percentage in each sample that the readers, uh, then I have this section, the readers of the essay will find the table inserted here on pages 18 through 19. The translator companies revise slightly, making no more than three revisions, okay? So column B is how many, it's one to three changes. Notice that in this, for this one, there's 23 that fit, 23 verses that fit this verse, and that would be 22.5% of, 22.3% of the text. If I were you guys, I would recommend you follow along and look up here because I'm going to note everything up here for you. So you don't have to keep flipping back, but you can obviously do it however you want. So that would apply then for all of these categories, all right? So then if we come to the first Westminster Company, five verses have no change for 5.9% of the text. 19 verses have one to three changes for 22.3%. If you come down here, they accept no verses without revision, so they revise all of the 121, 112 verses in some fashion, okay? So it's a little bit complicated. That's why we're going through it step by step. Go back to the notes. Translator companies revise slightly. So column four, labeled C, with the numbers four to seven in parentheses below, identifies the number of verses and percentage in each sample that the translator companies revise moderately, making from four to seven revisions. So column C with the four to seven, that would be four to seven revisions. And then column D, obviously eight plus would be they made eight or more what? Revisions to those verses, okay? So again, guys, this side is quant it's quantitative, right? It's talking about how many changes are being what? Made. Is everybody with this? And column five, labeled D, with the numbers eight plus in parentheses below, identifies the number of verses and percentage in each sample where the translator, translator companies greatly revise, making eight or more revisions. Now, I do not know why that seven is there. So, Amy, on the top page four, end of the first line, there's a seven. Okay. I don't know why that's there, so just circle that with a question mark. Okay? Mm -hmm. So... Does everybody understand what we're looking at here? All right. In group one, <clears throat> the total for columns A and B represent 20% of the revisions that the translator companies made. Okay. <clears throat> Whereas the totals for columns C and D represent 79.4. So that would be down here at the bottom. All right, so notice here, A and B, the total for all this, A and B, they 20.3% uh, have zero to three what? Changes. Is everybody following that? Okay. Uh, and, then we're, and then columns C and D together down here. So that would be four to eight or more a, almost 80% of the text has received revisions of at least four to eight plus changes. And we can see that down here with this number. Is everybody following that? I know you guys might not be able to see it because of the pulpit, but hopefully you can take a peek at that. So, two things are clear. The translators, the translators companies let very few verses pass their scrutiny without making any revisions. All right, so we look at the totals down here. For the sample, 80% have at least four what? 80% of the verses have at least four or more what? Revisions. 20% of the text have three or fewer, uh, three or fewer, including zero. So are they, so what does that tell you? Scrutinizing the text as they do their work. You guys with me so far, okay? Two things are clear. The translator companies let very few verses pass their scrutiny without making any revisions. Only some 11 of 300 or 3.6%. Likewise, so, so what does that mean? That means 
Only 3.6% have had, had zero, basically, only 11 verses of 300 in the list, or 3.6% had how many changes? Zero, okay? Likewise, the companies left few verses passed with only minor revisions. Some 51 of 300, or 17%. Indeed, these companies substantially revised the great majority of all verses. Some 238 of 300, or 79.4%. Especially noteworthy is the 92% of the work of the first Cambridge company is substantially revised. Noteworthy also in columns A and B are the identical statistics for the first Oxford and first Westminster companies, despite the fact that numerically first Oxford company has 103 verses and first Westminster company 85. Again, in columns C and D, these two companies are evenly matched. So he's talking about this right here. They're evenly what? I mean, they're only off by 0.2 from each other. So even though these guys had more verses, these guys had fewer verses, do they have the same percentage of heavy revision? Are you following this? Okay. Now I told you, the level of depth that we can look at here is amazing by charting this stuff out. All right. And we got to give Jacobs massive kudos for sitting here and doing all this stuff. All right? Now imagine, though, if he had done this for the whole Old Testament, what would this thing look like? It would be massively unwieldy, right? So his, his, his methodology of taking samples is a great way to go because it makes it more manageable for us to understand. All right? Now, in group two on the table, so that's this column here, group two. In group two on the table, Jacobs includes the revision work of the general meeting into his revision statistics. Okay? So let's stop there. This column is only showing what these three companies did. This column is going to now add on to that what how many changes were made by the committee of final what? Review at Stationers Hall in that final stage. Okay? Dr. Jacobs offers the following description <clears throat> for group two on the table. Quote, group two includes the work of the general meeting. This group is the most complex of the five groups. It gives several different but related ways of studying the translational work performed by the general meeting as it made a final review and revision of the work of the translator companies. Group two is also composed of five vertical columns. Column one labeled total GM revisions, okay? So that's right here. Total GM revisions would be the total revisions of the general what? GM stands for general meeting. Okay. Uh, where are we at here? Uh, so, ba, ba, ba. Group two is also composed of five vertical columns. Got that. Uh, column one labeled general total G GM revisions shows the total number of verses and percentages that the general meeting further revised uh, of each sample of the translator company's work. Columns two through five, labeled A through D, perform several functions, okay? So that would be these columns right here. A, D, A, B, C, D, okay? What are they for? Let's look. These columns take the total number of verses that the general meeting further revised and shows the classifications to which now, further revised verses first belonged after the translator companies had revised them. Okay? Now, just so we're clear about that, let's look at the next paragraph. As an example, the first Oxford company's revisions of Nahum and Habakkuk, column one, group two, labeled total general meeting revisions, reveals that out of the 103 verses, the first Oxford company approved or revised, the general meeting revised 25 verses or 24% of them, okay? So that is this right here, okay? So of the 103 total verses that are in this section, the general meeting revises how many? Now that I covered it up. 25 of the 103, so that's 25% do they, do they revise again? 
Following this. Seen a lot of blank stares. I'm still speaking English. I haven't diverted to Greek yet. I don't probably won't, but so let's 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 understand that again. And it, so I'm on that paragraph, we'll read it again. An example of the first Oxford Company's revisions of Nahum and Habakkuk, column one, group two, labeled total general meaning revisions, reveals that of the hundred and three verses the first Oxford Company approved or revised, the general meaning further revised twenty-five or twenty-four point three percent. So they in this test case there were 103 total verses right we know their statistics for this group this is forwarded now to the general meeting of the 103 verses in this section the general meeting makes or changes 25 amends 25 of the verses or 24.3 percent of that original 103 what verses now look folks is that again a very heavy level of scrutiny being done again now by the general meeting? You following that, all right? Next sentence, column two, group two, labeled A, shows that two of the 25 further, revi further revised verses, or 8% of the 25, had originally been approved by the first Oxford company as needing no revision, okay? so. That's this right here. So of these verses, two last were originally in the category of having no revision. The final review revises two of them, two of the 25. So of these 25 revisions, two of them correlate with A, which originally had no what? No changes. Now the general meeting comes along after the fact, and they change two of those 25 verses. So of the 25 verses, two of them were originally in A over here. Now they have changes, and that's 8% of the 25. You following how this works? Now you gotta have your math head on today, okay? All right, so. Um, Column 2, Group A, label, uh, label A shows that two of these 25 further, further revised verses, or 8% of 25, had originally been approved by the first Oxford company as needing no revision. Hence, these two further revised verses were originally classified as part of six unrevised verses in Column uh, C, A, Group 1. Right here. Like I showed you. These two further revised verses represent 33% of the six verses from column A, group one. So right here. You with that? So, two of the six is referring to this from over here. So of the original number, two of the six are done, which means that that percent is revised by the, by the general what? Me. Okay. Column three, group three, column three, group two, labeled B, shows that five of the 25 further revised verses, or 20%, had originally been revised only slightly by the first Oxford Company with one to three revisions, okay? So B here, again, correlates with B over here. And originally there were uh, 20, um, there were 23 verses here that were in the original category, okay? But now we're talking about the general meeting. So here we, here's the statistic, right? So this five of 23 relates back to this. So in this particular category of the 25 verses that were revised by the general meeting, five of them were originally in this category, which means they received further revision. So of the ones that were revised, 20% of it re was revised further, is what we can identify here, okay? Hence, these five verses were originally classified as part of 23 similarly revised verses in column B, group one. These five further revised verses represent 21.7% of the 23 verses in column B, Group one. So that's what we're talking about when I just showed you. Okay. So 
The statistics change now because of further revision. So of, there were originally 23 verses in B. Everybody see that? Now, five of those 23 are revised further by the general meeting. Okay? Column four, group two, labeled C, shows that five or more of the 25 further revised verses, or 20%, had originally been moderately, moderately revised by the first Oxford company with four to seven revisions. Hence, these five verses were originally classified as part of 24 similarly revised verses in column C. These five further revised verses represent 28% of the 24 verses in column C, group one, okay? So, again, originally there were how many verses in column C? 24, right? Of the 24, how many of them are further revised by the general meeting? Five or 20.8%, okay? Column five, group two, labeled D, shows that the final 13 of these 25 further revised verses had originally been greatly revised by the first Oxford company with eight or more revisions. Hence, these 13 verses were originally classified as part of uh, 50 similarly revised verses in group D column 1. These 13 revised verses represent 26% of the 50, 50 verses from column D group 1. Okay, so the same thing, right? Originally column D had how many verses? 50, right? Of the 50, how many of them are further revised by the general meeting? 13 or 26%, right? So then we can look at this whole row here then shows the totals for the general meeting. So of the 103 verses, 25 of the 103 are revised further by the general meeting for 24.3%. Of this 25, two are category A, two, I'm sorry, five are category B, five are category um, C and 13 are category what? D. So then we can get the totals here, okay? So, having, is everybody understanding this? I know it's a little bit tricky to follow at first, which is why I love having the ability to draw this stuff out and walk you guys through what is being said here. Now, let's just stop there for a minute. We're only talking here about a total of 300 verses. Look at, so this is all, this column, column, group one, is all of the work of each company. This column is the work of the general meeting. How much scrutiny are they putting the text through? A ton. The general meeting of the 300 verses, this, this, this is the data here for what they change, and then we have another level of revision now by the final, uh, by the committee of final review here in this column. So by the time this thing gets printed, has it been scrutinized and scrutinized and scrutinized again? Statistically, okay? Having, uh, did we read this last paragraph? We did. Did we read the, did we read the having thus proceeded paragraph? I don't, no. did we or not? No. Okay. Having thus proceeded through first Oxford Company, there is no need to labor through similar sets of statistics for the Westminster and first Cambridge companies. So in other words, if we do it for this one, you, the same stuff would apply where? To, to, to the following two, okay? Let us look rather at these, what these figures tell us about the work of the companies in the general meeting. The general meeting further revised 91 of 300 verses, or 30.3% of all the verses that the translator companies had previously revised. So let's look at that. That is down here. So if you take the total now for all three companies, the general meeting makes 91 additional changes to the original 300 verses. In addition to the um, 300 changes that had already been made. No, that's not right. No, I'm back. So let me restate this. 90, of the 300 verses, 
91 additional changes are made by the general meeting, which equals 30.3% of the text is further revised by the general meeting. Let's go back to the notes. The general meeting further revised 91 of 300 verses or 30.3% of all those verses that the translator companies had previously revised. Only 15% of the 91 further revised verses, uh, only 15 of these 91 further revised verses or 16.3% or had originally minor or no revisions. So that would be this right here at the bottom, A and B, 16.3% originally had either zero to three revisions, right? The great majority of the 91 verses, 76 or 83.6, had already received moderate to heavy revision from the translator companies. So that's this part right here. So there's a heavy, heavy, continual revising on that percentage of the text in those 76 verses. That had already been received, that had already been heavily revised at 80% over here. Okay? Uh, ba -ba -ba. Uh, it is clear then that the general meeting play, paid close attention to every aspect of the work of the translator companies. To those verses that the companies had considered, uh, to those verses that the companies had considered correct, as they were in the 1602 bishops as well as to those verses that had been revised slightly, moderately, or greatly. Now, is everybody following this? What we're looking at is a statistical analysis of the actual level of revision that was done to the text in a quantitative way. We're looking at number of what? Changes. Okay? So, the purpose of group three, so that would be this column here in the middle, the purpose of group three is to chart how many additional revisions the general meeting provided for each of the 91 verses that it further revised. Okay? So, we know that the total revisions by the general meeting was how many? 91. 25 from 1st Oxford, 34 from 1st Westminster, 32 from 1st Cambridge, right? We know that the total number of revised verses was 91. So now what this column is going to do is look at what is the nature of these revisions, okay? So group three consists of four vertical columns. Column one labeled total General meeting revision shows the total verses and percentages of the general meeting further revised of each, each translator's company's work. Columns two through four labeled B2, C2, D2 employ the same classification slash numerical scheme exhibited for the work of the translators in group one. So in other words, this corresponds with what? The same thing back over here, all right? So B2 is one through three changes, four to seven changes, eight plus changes, which is what the same thing we saw back over here, all right? Uh, okay, columns B2, C2, D2 classify the verses that the general meeting revised according to the number of revisions that the general meeting supplied for each verse. Column B2, the first Oxford company, states that the general meeting further revised 22 of 25 verses of this company's work, but did so by supplying only minor changes, one through three words per verse, okay? So that would be this right here. So of the 25 changes that were made to the first Oxford company's work, 22 of them were only one to three what? Revisions. One or 4% was four to seven, and two were two, uh, two verses were eight or more changes at 8%. So are we following that? Uh, back to the notes. Column C2 states, the general meeting made moderate revisions to four, uh, four to seven words for one verse already revised by the company. Column D2 indicates that the general meeting made significant revisions of eight 
or more words to two verses already revised by the company. Important conclusions follow from an analysis of group three. While the general meeting further revised 91 of 300 verses, some 33%, its revisions were almost totally of a minor sort, quantitatively speaking, okay? So, let me get back, I've lost my spot, I'm sorry. Uh, where, were we, where were we at? Last part, right? Uh, its revisions were almost totally of a minor sort, quantitatively speaking, 81 of 91 verses, um, further revised, or 89% in category B2, for only 10 of 91 verses, or 10.9%, has the general meeting made more than minor revisions. Thus, there is an inverse relationship between columns A through D of group 1 and columns B2 through D2 of group 3. The nature of that relationship is that group 1, let's, let's stop there and understand, okay? So here we have the total revisions for the general meeting, or 33%. That's the same number we saw over here, okay? So, 81 of the 91, or ni oh, nearly 90% of the changes are only one to three changes. Eight changes, or 8.8%, are they've made four to seven changes to the text. And only two of the verses, or 2.1%, have they made eight or more changes to the verse. You following that? Okay. So now what he's saying is, if you take and compare this information here with this information here, you're going to see what he's calling an inverse relationship. In other words, are there, it's flipped, right? Here you see a bunch, here you don't see nearly as much, right? So let's go back to the bottom of page five. Um, thus, there's an inverse relationship between columns A through D in group one, that's down here, and columns B2 through D2 in group three. The nature of the relationship is that in group one, 62 of 300 verses, or 20.3% 20, 20 of the verses, that the translators' companies revise are in categories A and B. But in group, three, eight, uh, in group three, 81 of 91 verses, or 89% of the verses the general meeting for the revised are, are in category B2. In group one, 238 of the verses, of the 300 verses, for 79.4% of all of the verses the translator companies revise are in category C and D. Whereas in group three, 10, of the 91 verses, or only 10.9% of the verses that the general meeting further revised are in category C through D. So he's saying, do you see the inverse relationship when you compare the level and amount of revision that is happening here by the translator companies versus what is now happening in the general meeting? The general meeting, in other words, are they only making fine moves to finish the text the massive amount of revision has, the majority of it has already what? Been done. So, such a relationship substantiates Professor Allen's answer to a problem that scholars have long pondered. How much revisionary work could the general meeting have accomplished in a short span of nine months or so? Could this committee have done much more than give formal assent to the work of the translator companies? Professor Allen's work, translating for King James, that needs to be in italics. Translating for King James needs to be italicized. Has answered this question. In particular, his analysis of Boyce's notes for 1 Peter argues convincingly that the general meeting paid the closest attention to its task. And the figures regarding the inverse relationship cited above bear out Professor Allen's conclusions. The general meeting reviewed carefully all of the translation work approved the majority as, as it stood, some 70%, and so to the remaining 30% that it found lacking supplied mainly minor revisions of one to three corrections per verse. Based on these complete sample books, uh, it will not do then to assert that the general meeting revised 30% of the work of the companies. It did not completely revise 30% of the translator's work. Rather, 89% of this figure, of this 30% figure, or 81 of 91 verses, 
further revised constitutes only further minor changes of one to three revisions. Convincibly, not conceivably, sorry, nine months worth of work have been uh, would have been sufficient for the general meeting to review all of the work of the companies. So, by the time this thing gets to the general meeting, is it 80%, 70 to 80% done? And the general meeting in nine months, they go through the whole work, and do they make mostly minor changes? Statistically, okay? For the sake of time and space, we will forego commenting extensively upon groups four and five of Jacob's table. Both of these groups are more provisional as they are designed to roughly quantify the number of transcribing errors in BOD 1602 that need to be correct that needed to be corrected by the general meeting. That should say that needed to be corrected by the general meeting. He says about this quote. Evidence points to the fact that a single person recorded these annotations. Just stop there for a minute. One guy went and made all these, noted all these changes. It's unbelievable. The evidence points to the fact that a single person recorded these annotations. It was surely a Herculean task for a single person to do this work in such a methodical way. Not to mention the logistical problems of traveling and transporting about a bound full, uh, 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 translating about, should say, an unbound folio Bible, or even a portion, I'm sorry, it's right, transporting about a bound folio Bible, or even a portion of an unbound folio. Any human was bound to err at times in transcribing the work the translators, uh, from the translator companies into the Bible. All told, the sample passages considered by Jacobs in groups four and five allow for the following summative takeaways. So we're just going to go to the takeaways on this, and we're not going to um, go through the whole detail analysis. The margin of error then appears to be a negligible fact in ascertaining the percentage factor of the revisions that the general meeting has made. At the same time, the error factor would be significant when measuring the total amount of physical work the general, me the general meeting performed. The general meeting not only corrected the errors, but also revised further the already revised verses. Top page 7. In recording the revisions into the master co copy Bible, the annotator has made 5, 5 and 10 error, that doesn't make sense has made five, comma, it's there twice or something, I need to look at that, that doesn't make sense, and 10 errors at 103, 85 and 112 verses respectively. The margin of error ranges from 4.9 to 9% for an average of 6.7. Average accurate, accuracy averages 93.3. Such a score, perhaps, would be dissatisfying to most of us, if after several hundred years, our own efforts could be rated as well. This guy's accuracy in hand recording the revisions is 93.3% in the margin and interlinear in the BOD 1602. Okay, how much we got left here? Uh, we might just squeak this out, okay? The second half of Jacob's paper contains a discussion of the qualitative <clears throat> Discussion, the second discussion can be removed from that sentence. The second half of Jacob's paper contains a discussion of the qualitative... I don't like it, but... Of the types of linguistic revisions made by the Old, Tes Old Testament companies and the general meeting. Since this collation deals primarily with the work of the general meeting, we will forego further discussion of the essay... Uh, essay currently. We will circle back to it in a future lesson when we will discuss the notes of John Boyce in the general meeting. For now, suffice it to say that when BOD 1602 is compared against a 1611 edition of the King James Bible, the work of the general meeting comes into focus as they place the final touches upon the authorized version. So look guys, you can see minutely, statistically, and qualitatively, the amount of changes that are being made. 
through a sample of this, okay? What this shows you is the extreme level of scrutiny, detail, and meticulous nature that the translators used as they went about this process, all right? While we have followed the work of Jacob closely in these lessons, it's important to note some other possible options about where uh, the Bod 1602 Old Testament fits into the work in progress timeline. Dr. David Norton, author of A Textual History of the King James Bible, weighs in on the options. Now, I'm going to commend that to you to read on your own, okay? I think Jacob's work is conclusive that the Old Testament section is late. The work on the Old Testament is late, indicating the work then that was given to the general meaning for final review. And we can look at the statistics. I think Jacobs has done the definitive work on this in evaluating where all of this fits. Okay, Go to page 8. <clears throat> Middle of the page, there's some more information from Norton on the statistics and where it fits on the work in progress timeline. I'm not going to read all that to you. I want to go to the end, okay? Page 8. In the end, there is no reason to doubt the conclusions of Dr. Jacobs. Bod 1602 is a work in progress primary document recording the textual emendations of the King James translators as they revised the 1602 Bishop's Bible into what would become the authorized version of 1611. The annotations found in the Old Testament portion of Bod 1602 are indicative of the state of the text as the work passed from the company stage to the general meaning. To me, that is, be, I think Jacobs has absolutely proved that, both in his uh, analysis of the readings, like we saw in the last two lessons, lesson 172 and 173, and now in his uh, quantitative work here by looking at the number of changes and where they are, where they are falling out in comparison to what ends up in the King James Bible as he compares it with Bod 1602. In the next lesson, we will begin looking at the New Testament portion of Bod 1602. So does anybody have any questions about all this? Now, I understand this is highly technical, all right? But you have to understand and get a, get a sense of where this document fits in the grand scheme of things. This is, the Old Testament uh, annotations are late, and we can compare them against the 1611, and we can know where a lot of these things happened. And just understand that this statistical analysis is only for a sample size of 300 verses. Imagine what happens if you do this for the entire Old Testament. I mean, it, it's, it would be massively huge and probably almost unwieldy to comprehend that the, the, those numbers and what those figures would look like much less conduct the actual statistical analysis. Okay? So, have we got any questions or comments before we sign off? Bart? Uh, in the general meeting, that you said there was 12 members. Was there um, a foreman, or was it like a jury, or how did they... Um, decision. Well, we'll study that. We'll study the general meeting in detail when we look at Boyce's notes. When we're done looking at Bob 16 and 2, we're going to look at Boyce's notes in detail. And the, the best answer I can give you is that it's a consensus. One of, one of the great misnomers about the King James Bible is that the King James translators were in 100 total complete agreement with each other about every verse and every reading. That's just not the case. Boyce's notes prove that as he records the discussion that was happening amongst some of those 12 men. So I think it is best to look at the 1611 as the consensus of the 47 men who worked on it as it went through individual work, company work, and then the general meeting work. Most of the text is ironed out by the time it gets to this point. But there is still some of it that came up for discussion and further review and revision. So I would say that at the general meeting, there are 12 men. At least that is what tradition tells us. We don't know for sure 
that that's true. Well, let's say that it is. We only know the names specifically of three or four men that were there. We don't even know all of the names of the 12 that were there. But we do know from Boyce's notes, as he took notes on the proceedings from Romans through Revelation, that there was disagreement amongst some of them about what some of the readings should be. So I would say that you should view the 1611 as the consensus of the process of what they thought it should be. I don't really know how else to look at it. So if there was a disagreement, I don't know if they had a vote. I don't know, you know exactly how they settled it, but the evidence suggests that yes, there was some disagreement about how some of the stuff should, should read. So yeah, well, but we'll look at that more in detail at the, um, when we look at Boyce's notes. Anybody else with a question or a comment? In, in, a nut, in a nutshell, group one is the results of VOD 1602, and then, of course, the final revi re revision is group two. So in a nutshell, yes, this represents the number of changes that were made to the Bishop's Bible, okay, that then showed up in the King James. This column, group two, represents verses in that same section that were further revised beyond Bot 1602 that then showed up in the King James Bible. Okay, that's, that's what it looked like because of the, the percentage ratio. Correct. That, and that is exactly the way you should, and then group, group three is just to correlate back to this to show you the inverse relationship of the changes. So by the time you get to the final review, 80, 70 to 80 percent of the changes have all been what? Made. So the, the final review, the committee of final review revises somewhere between 20 to 30 percent of the text. The vast majority of them into the 80 percent are only minor revision of one to three changes. Okay. All right. Anybody, anybody else with a question? All right. Again, next Sunday, we're going to start looking at the New Testament portion of Bod 1602, all right? Um, and I'll have more to say about that next week. But